So, konnichiwa. Thank you, everybody, for coming to my talk uh, about surviving project and abandonment, uh, specifically inspired by Meteor.js. Uh, so, be a bit of a case study on this. Uh, but before we start, uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jan Vorak. I'm also known online as Storyteller or Storyteller CZ, if the other Storyteller has stolen my nickname uh, on the platform, such as Twitter. Uh, I am from Prague, Czechia. Uh, I've studied in America at Workshop Streams of Technology, and since 2015 I have been involved with uh, Meteor.js. Uh, right now I'm Meteor.js core community contributor. I co-host uh, something called Meteor Dispatches, which is a weekly news show about, uh, about Meteor and what's happening around that sphere. And I've built two businesses on top of Meteor. One of them is Litter Universe. And I'm also, as you can guess by the t-shirt, uh, one of the official Meteor ambassadors. So thank you for having me here. And let's see what we'll get to. So if you want to, you can uh, scan the Slido. If you have any questions, you can put them in. I'll be happy to answer them at the end. Also, there is a question right now. Uh, you know, do you know? Or have you heard about Meteor.js before coming to this talk? So first of all, I'll cover for probably most of you what actually is Meteor.js. Uh, we'll go quickly through its uh, almost over 10 years history at this point. Uh, we'll look at you know, what is, you know, pro or when is project or community dead, if such a thing even is possible, uh, why Meteor didn't die why other communities maybe didn't die as well. And then we kind of go uh, to the meat of this talk, which is how to fortify your community and some helpful tools that I can give you that I found through how you have worked with Meteor and uh, beyond. And also kind of look a little bit into the future for everybody, especially Meteor. So uh, what is Meteor? Uh, the big question, first of all, as expected, uh, most of you have not heard of Meteor. Just a hands up, who has heard Meteor before? So we have two people. Awesome. So, and before we proceed further, I have another question for all of you. What's your position? You know, who, who is here for you know, community manager, are you developer? programmer, DevOps, or something else, so just so I can get an idea what you might want to hear. <laughs> Are we coming? A lot of fun. Let's see. No community managers? Open yeah. source contributors. There we go. L nice little game here. <laughs> oh, so we have some community managers. Interesting. DevOps, yay. All right. So, oh, developer program is so for the other. Anybody wants to quickly shout out volunteer? What's your position? So, uh, what's, what's not included in here? Anybody? I'm a consultant. Okay. Anybody else? Consultants? All right, so we have a very surprising spread. Honestly, I was expecting to have more of a community managers and open source uh, contributors here as the primary place, but uh, that's fine. Let's now then jump back to Meteor itself. So uh, what is Meteor? Uh, it's a full stack JavaScript framework for real-time application, real-time uh, used here a bit loosely. I just had a talk with somebody who is like on the, uh, you know, I'm not sure if kernel, but you know, really close to where I have a bit different definition of real-time. Uh, but here we are talking about web. So it's built on top of Node, Express, and we're also using MongoDB. And through publication and subscription, what you do, you subscribe to, uh, I could say, a set of data, and then Meteor watches the data for you. And if something changes in that data set, it will push it to you, uh, to the client, where it's kept also locally. And if you want to change something, you use uh, methods, which are RPCs, to change the data. So you could say the holy trinity. 
Uh, it's super uh, easy with zero config just to get started. Of course, if you want to tweak more, you can always do that. And uh, not at the beginning, but today it's also front-end agnostic. It's also very well known for its uh, account system. So just add a few packages and you have full-fledged account system. You don't have to use any expensive uh, SaaS to have accounts. Uh, big thing, uh, with the exception of Meteor 3, uh, is that it's been very much backward compatible and super easy to upgrade. And uh, really specific, uh, really easy to get started on that, so it's very popular for startups to iterate quickly or people who just want to get you know, right into building a project without having to configure build tools and all the other things. Uh, big of a historical anomaly, it also has its own uh, meter specific packages and I don't mean it has like them on NPM, we have an entire system for managing uh, you know, meteor packages. And that will kind of become apparent from the history, I'm really going to go through it, I'm not going to go that much into the technical details of all those things. We can talk about it afterwards because this is mostly focused on the community and all the drama that happened through the years. And if you want to, I can also link you to a more uh, in detail presentation of the history. So uh, it goes all the way back to uh, December 2011 when Skybreak was announced and in January of next year it was renamed to Meteor. Uh, it secured funding for something called Meteor Development Group, which was the company behind Meteor. So it was my T guys. And it quickly uh, gained quite a lot of interest and traction because it focused on these real-time features and other things. So remember this is you know, 2012, uh, in many cases, infancy of today's uh, JavaScript ecosystem, so a lot of the things like build tools, packaging, all those things were uh, very much in the air and NPM, for example, was not as dominant as it's today. Uh, and other things like hot code push and so on were added and it gained traction. You can see today we stand at uh, 44,000 GitHub stars and even then it was one of the most starred project of its day. Uh, and as I mentioned about real-time feature in 2013, it started using uh, MongoDB Oplog to support reactivity. A bit of a hack even to this day, so changes going in the future. And in 2014, there was Meteor 1.0, big milestone, and there was something called the Worldwide Meteor Day on the 6th of November. So all over the world, uh, there were ha meetups happening to celebrate the release of 1.0. So I remember it was like map, of course, all over America, Europe, but even a lot here, here you know, in Asia, India specifically, uh, of course, South America as well. So it was all over the place, uh, big community, you know, New York, Paris, one of the biggest ones, uh, besides, of course, the ones in California. And that was, I would say, beginning of the golden age, which lasted a little bit uh, until 2015 where things started uh, to change. Uh, it was very much also a reaction to the great changes that were happening in the JavaScript ecosystem. If you remember 2015, it was a wild west in JavaScript. You know, we have React really coming into prominence, NPM uh, you know, becoming the de facto packaging system, all those other new exciting technologies were happening, which created a a lot of buzz in the Meteor community because Meteor was in addressing all those deficiencies before, let's say, more of a walled garden. For example, uh, as we have here, uh, this is the logo of Blaze.js, which was the front end specifically uh, designed for Meteor, similar to handlebars. But people wanted, you know, they wanted to use React later, they wanted to use Vue and all the other new cool front ends, and that was not possible. Uh, at least until later in 2015 uh, and we had our first controversies but for controversies to happen uh, and we will discuss it we had the establishment of Meteor Forums which became the center of uh, you could say the community so where everybody gathered it wasn't just maintainers but also all the people 
using it as well, and that's a very important thing that I'll discuss more later. Uh, at this point, you know, we have a lot of community in involvement, a lot of new packages are coming online, and you know, the roles packages and everything else. So whatever Meteor is missing, there usually was a community package for that. Uh, but as things evolve in 2015, we, as I mentioned, we have first controversy. First was what to do with Blaze after enabling to install, for example, React in Meteor. And there came you know, the vision from the team what Blaze 2.0 should be. And in a sense, it was a transition from Blaze to React, so kind of the first step. So, of course, everybody was like, you know, why should then we continue to use Blaze? What's the point? Uh, and you can probably imagine how developers can get once they get heated about you know technical issues like that. Uh, so that was a uh, big controversy for myself since I was actually writing my first application meter. I was like, okay, you know, if the future is React, I'm just going to switch to React and deal with the. Uh, annoyances, because that's where we are going to end up anyway, uh, which many people did. Um, and as the year went on, there was a lot of feeling that MDG, Meteor Development Group, was not uh, involved with the community enough. Uh, I could say it was a lack of communication and follow-up through on certain uh, efforts. And I remember also reading like one of the post articles where they specifically stated that for example, to add something from Meteor that didn't came from them, they will be waiting until actually the community builds it, and then they are going to choose the best solution, which has certain logic, but they also kind of felt that, okay, Meteor MDG is not leading kind of here the way for Meteor forward and just kind of following from the community. Things start getting really interesting in uh, 2016, because after the backlash to Blaze 2.0 proposal, it was canceled, and we had some uh, major community contributors starting to leave for other projects. Uh, we had, as I mentioned, some efforts didn't follow up through, but we had interesting camp, was uh, Meteor Camp, which happened at the UN in New York. It was a big gathering of uh, Meteor developers from around the world. And I was there myself, and it was really great being in this grand uh, you know, UN meeting room, uh, not, not the main one that you from the General Assembly, but a smaller one, and have everybody there, also like you know, some people famous from the community. Uh, and it, but it was kind of a bit of a roller coaster. You know, the first day ended kind of on like a sour note, you know, what's, what's, what's the future of Meteor? Second day was more hopeful. Uh, but uh, MDG, uh, started kind of working on to fix some of the issues that they perceived with Meteor, which was, of course, managing the data. Because real time is nice, but if, if any of you have managed real time, you will probably know that uh, it comes uh, with a big uh, scalability cost. So, in order to kind of work with that, plus not just to be able to tie in with MongoDB, but also to expand to other databases, MDG introduced Apollo GraphQL, which probably will know as well. And that became super successful. You know, even to this day, I think they have upcoming uh, conference soon in San Francisco as well. Uh, but by our beginning in 2017, they were will steep keep supporting Meteor and will also focus on Apollo. Uh, but by next year, there was only one part-time developer working on Meteor, which meant that you know releases slowed down to Crawler and many other people started leaving, which is naturally, if you see that the project is not being advanced, that you will go find something else. Uh, 2018, we had the last official meetup attempt, uh, Meteor Night in San Francisco. Sadly, there were some technical difficulties, so it was not streamed, so if you weren't there, uh, you didn't really get anything out of it, which is a shame because there were some interesting things announced like, you know, TypeScript rewrite of the co core and so on. But uh, through the years, late 2018 and 2019, as there was like no direction, official direction or communication, community started organizing by itself on the forums and, uh, you know, 
2019, we established something called Meteor Community Packages, where we took out uh, or we took very favorite uh, packages through the community and started maintaining them together as a community. I have seen similar efforts in other communities as well to make sure that packages that everybody depends on still have support and updates. Um, and I've also organized uh, Meteor Impact Conferences from 2020 to 2022. But even despite all of our efforts, you know, if you don't have the official backing and support, uh, then it will be difficult, not just financially and time-wise, so to kind of get the excitement up because, yeah, we are like community, but we cannot make any official announcements or guarantees. Uh, big change also happened in 2019 where Meteor was acquired by Tiny, but the big problem was that none of the Meteor developers from the core team moved over to Tiny. They all stayed with Apollo, so Tiny got the trademark, got the code, and now they have to build their company from scratch, uh, which is now Meteor Software. Uh, still, uh, efforts started on that, and we finally got a lot of merges of old pull requests, and in 2021, we had Meteor 2.0. Uh, we had other community initiatives, uh, like a community viewer of Meteor packages called Packosphere, and in this year, we got Meteor 3.0 of that was almost two works, two years of work uh, because of a major change of moving from uh, fibers to a single weight. Uh, if you know, you know. If not, then that, would be, that could be its own interesting talk. But it was, I would say, the first time there was a major uh, breaking upgrade that required everybody to touch their applications. In other, other cases, you know, there were, yes, some breakages, but oftentimes, it only involved you if you are using specific package or specific part. So that, that was a big part, and I think we'll be still having, even to next year, we'll be still talking about upgrading to Meteor 3. So through this, you know, a lot of the times we had on the forums classically, oh, Meteor is dead, you know, it's all over, panics, panic people. And the big question is, when is a project dead? And in open source, uh, that's a hard thing to answer because open source projects can become zombified or you know, they can be resurrected as long you know, as the code is open, accessible, and there aren't any other restrictions like a license. Uh, we even have, you know, even archive projects can still be unarchived, brought back, can be forked. Uh, I think the only way where you cannot really resurrect it is as I said, you know, if it's not open source, if you don't have access, if you have license restrictions, or maybe if there are some uh, proprietary ways how to release, uh, which is in this case, for example, case of Meteor, in order to make an official Meteor release, it goes through proprietary servers and release process, which is not open source. So that's a potential problem for Meteor as well. But kind of as I was trying to look, you know, can we actually you know, kill a project or like kind of on its own, just leave it and be dead? Yes, if there's of course nobody around. But even then, if somebody comes 10 years later, forks it or starts working on it again, it can be resurrected. Which has interesting implication, uh, not just you know, that uh, say projects never actually end, and uh, if we look, you know, we are kind of reaching, I would say, maybe the first or second generation of open source, and we'll be going to code bases that maybe, the, that maybe everybody is already dead, whoever has worked on it. Uh, so we have to also start kind of thinking, maybe if there's some way to sunset projects that we actually want to sunset. Uh, it's, of course, different in corporate or in you know, in any closed source, for example, uh, Adobe Flash Flex, they said it's over, no more, it's owned by companies, so that's that for that. So with all of this, you know, could say the company pivoting to something which makes more sense for them business-wise, a uh, lot of panic on the forums, uh, and many people leaving the community, why didn't Meteor 
die. And uh, as I just said, you know, any project can be resurrected, though with Meteor it would be quite difficult. But what I identified is that because of the golden era of Meteor, we had a lot of packages, a lot of extensions, so it was still very easy to jump in and get uh, get a job done. Despite uh, you know having only a part-time developer on Meteor, development was still happening, so there was still hope, and that's that's a, that's a big important you know part. If, if you know if there is hope, then people will find a way to try to make it happen. Uh, all the ecosystem tools, despite proprietary, were still working and operational, so you can still publish new packages. Uh, and everything was working, and. I would really credit the forums, which was a center area where everybody could gather, plan, discuss, you know, in keeping the community alive. Um, big also part is that, you know, if you look or if you talk with any of the, you know, Meteor uh, developers who stayed through all these uh, hard times where it, where it literally looked gloomy, that we are like really loyal and devoted and uh, maybe a tad fanatical about Meteor. <laughs> so that also helps, you know, if you have a fanatical fan base around the project. And at the end of the day, you know, despite all the problem, if you just, you know, wanted to build a project, it just worked. You know, they, there was nothing really stopping you from maybe some minor issues here and there, but again, you can overcome that. So Meteor is not um, alone, you could say, in this trend. Here are some sampling of other communities that uh, some would, may, you might remember fondly <laughs> or not. Uh, and sometimes I think, why, are, why the heck is this technology still alive? Uh, Backbone, Ember, I have on, a, have on good authority that they are still you know, active and ongoing. Of course, jQuery. Uh, I think you know the millions of uh, articles and Stack Overflow question of jQuery uh, will continue to remain for as long as Stack Overflow exists, and people will constantly uh, go for it, you know, even in the future. And even COBOL, which started in the 1950s, is still ongoing, and they're actually adding new feature. And I could say there is a renaissance in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people are dismayed here. So, but it makes sense, you know, if you want to make good money and learn COBOL and then go into the big corporations. But I said, you know, I've actually just checked this morning and there's actually, I think, let's see, there was COBOL 2019, I believe, and either this year or last year there was a new release and they added object uh, oriented programming into that and other things. So, you know, communities are still going, you know, even despite, you could say, you know, their golden era is gone and mass, massively, you know, the, you could say, the community as a whole has to move on. A uh, big part of that is, I believe, because of, uh, you could say, the momentum in corporate. If you, you know, build a huge system in some old, or, or at this point, old technology, Upgrading it or changing it is uh, sometimes very difficult. You know, I would say prime example right here. So you kind of keep on going that, and uh, you know, don't really want to move from that. Uh, Japan, I think, in this case, is very uh, specific because oftentimes, like when I'm looking on some hotels or onsens, found and like, oh, the early 2000s just came to visit me because of the you know, design everything. But you know, once you have that website, especially if you are not a technology company in this industry, uh, then you know, why change it if it still works? And now we kind of can get uh, to the meet. Uh, just one thing, I will also ex explore a little bit how even with shrinking, uh, you know, could say, user base, you can still maintain those communities. But let's look uh, very quickly how we can actually, or not quickly, this is the main thing, how to fortify, what can we learn from Meteor and all these other communities, what's going on. So first of, first of all, we need to know what does a stable project look like. 
and uh, of course it needs to be active in some way. Development, you have to have maintainers, have releases, even if it's once a year. Uh, communication, I have to underline that really communication is the key and hopefully you have an active community. Uh, it's good to have clear governments, up-to-date documentation or at least usable documentation because if the documentation says uh, something very different than what the actual code does then uh, that's a big problem uh, unless it's very easy to read the code. Big part uh, of all of this is trust. You know, do you have trust between the maintainers and you know the user base or in general the developers and everybody involved? Uh, a lot of the trust you could say has between MDG and uh, back in the days and the you know fans of Meteor has been lost because of the neglect and lack of communication and you know even Meteor software still struggles struggles to this day uh, you know to kind of build that trust because we've been burned as a community in the past and uh, so we are very skeptical about that. Additional bonuses for let's say stable project is a good license usually these days MIT or any of the other open source license are going to do uh, presence at conferences you know that's why we had in Meteor we had Meteor Impact conferences that's why I'm here as well uh, we have teaching materials so that new people can onboard uh, you know and of course big one is extensions you have packages and other things and a big bonus is if you have actually money to feed the people who are working on it anybody wants to add something to this what they think is important i have i have missed okay so uh, for development uh, from our experiences is you know automate what you can documentation releases for example in meteor uh, we have js docs in the code and in the documentation uh, we have like a snippets that will take the js doc and import it there you know as a table with the information so if something changes in the code you don't have to then go through documentation and find all the references to that so you know, it's not full automation, but it's a good first step. And there are other, so, uh, you know, softwares out there that can help you to just, you know, do a basic output of all the methods in your code. Uh, big one is to have redundancies on personnel uh, or maintainers and developers that I think every project uh, might struggle with, except for the big ones. I'll cover a bit more later. And you know, set standard testing, linting, so that it's you know the code is not different from file to file or based of just what the latest developer has done that. And uh, one thing that I think is not really talked about much, and it kind of goes to the redundancies, is emergency plans. Uh, and this goes from you know what happens if this developer leaves or if something happens to them, or maybe. You know, what happens if our data center where we ho host our, you know, binaries goes down? Do we have redundancies for that? Uh, what happens when we get, you know, a CVE, security notice? What, what is the process? So those, those things are uh, important. I always say, you know, uh, and no plan can survive uh, contact with reality but planning is indispensable. So if you have all those things uh, kind of at least planned out, gamed out a little bit, once something happens, you will not be running around like, you know, chicken without his head. But at least, have, okay, we have at least these things, we can kind of go from there and figure out what to do. Uh, big thing, uh, I think this goes even beyond fortifying is community. That's what everything is built around. And big part here is what you really, if you want to fortify a community, you first need to know what, who is your customer, who are, who is your people in the community. So, who are the stakeholders? So, you know, who is the people who actually are going to be paying the bills and helping you keep that things up and running? Who are, you know, your influencers and key contributors? So, you know, know all of your maintainers, know who else is influencing in the space. For example, a meteor. 
Uh, he doesn't do that anymore, but in the past, Scott Stolinski of Syntax FM, uh, even to this day he is uh, you know, a Meteor fan, so that's important to know. It's uh, important to establish, uh, establish, you could say, communication and uh, contact with those, pe with those people. Uh, I would say that's also one of the problems or past problems with Meteor is that MDG and uh, even to this day, although much better, Meteor software is still struggling to get in touch with all these influencers. And back in the MDG days, that also is the reason why a lot of these people left, because they didn't have any contact or they didn't feel any support from the company itself. Which, and that can make a lot. Uh, big thing is designing proper communication channels. Uh, if, if the community is already established, you need to go to them. So if there are you know, Discord servers, go there, establish your presence. If not, you have a great opportunity to centralize and des designate official communication channels. You will need probably a bit of a mix, but in this case, again, that's why I say you know, the Meteor forms were super critical you know, for Meteor to survive, because without that, you know, Slack, Discord back then really weren't a thing, so we wouldn't have any way to concentrate. And uh, especially unless you are a maintainer or a contributor, you are not really in the GitHub repository, even though I'm there as a contributor every day. But most people are not there. As I mentioned, kind of in passing, empowering your community to, you know, reach out to them. Hey, how can we you know help? How can and in that, how can you help to make you know the project more interesting? In that, uh, and find a proper communication voice. So, for example, in Meteor Community, we are super allergic to any corporate jargon. So, if you come to Meteor Community with all these uh, you know corporate wording and flower language. Some people are going to have allergic reaction to you and run you out of the town. That was one of the drama that happened <laughs> relatively recently, which also kind of presents a bit of a cultural sticking points. But even despite that, you know, we will have to probably find out you have, you have to communicate. Because if there is no communication, you are as good as dead. So uh, very quickly, uh, governance and finances. Uh, I say always, open source is a distribution model, not a business model. That's why MDG pivoted to Apollo GraphQL, because that was a better business model for them. Meteor sadly did not meet those expectations. Absolutely reasonable for a company. But for the project itself, it's an issue today. You know, we have GitHub sponsors, Open Collective, all those things. And you need to, based on what, what your business model around that is, to establish that at the very least, you know, GitHub sponsors for your key uh, contributors is, uh, I would say, a must these days. And then from that, you can say, you know, if you go more to the business part, sponsor where what's your maybe paid support, commercial offering, and so on. Big thing also is mindset. Um, so there's this book called The Infinite Gay by Simon Sinek, uh, which after it meter transition to Tiny, that uh, was one of the big things that the new CEO put up. And The Infinite Game is very much uh, tells you how to look, as I says, to the infinite game. You know, not just, you know, okay, we need to meet this metric in this month, how, how to move on the company. So a uh, big thing also today, uh, maybe you might know, uh, you know, the thousand true fans. Uh, that's from an essay, uh, let me just hear my notes, from Kevin Kelly that breaks if you have thousand fans that give you $100 per year. That's all you need to live happily as, as one person. And you can, in I would say, especially in software, you can scale it up to 100 true fans, which give you each $1,000 a month, oh, sorry, a year. So you get to 100,000 a year. And for you as one person, that's a good thing. So, and that's why a lot of the smaller communities can survive, because you know, if you have a loyal core, 
that's willing to pay in. You just need a few, you know, is that, you know, 100 fans for one supporter that pays, you know, 1,000 a year, you're set. So, very quickly, some tooling. Good news is you don't really know, need that much, especially if you're a smaller community. Starting with GitHub Insights to see, you know, who is your main contributor. That's good. Uh, you can then go to open source. Let me see if we can jump in. So here we can look at Meteor. You can see all the history and you can see here all the developers and their activities. So if, if you don't know, you can jump in. Or we can look here at open source, which kind of gives you additional breakdowns and finds who is there right here and some other additional aspect like open SSF score, uh, contributor confidence, and other things to kind of look at your project. It goes much beyond that, but what you really want to look at are your contributors if you want to find, find my maintainers. But that is for contributors and maintainers. Uh, there are other tools uh, to look on. I kind of mentioned how many people uh, do you need or can you lose? So that's the bus and pony factor that you want to look into. Specifically our tools around chaos. We have Apache Dev Lake, and you want to look into those tools. You want to get more insights into you know, your developers' contributors. Uh, big things kind of are looking at this is you know low reverse to get started for newcomers. Uh, Meteor can be quite intimidating because it's a big project. You need to know, or mainly for these, it gives you the know, know how on the critical people. And also, hopefully, reduce data silos. Community wise, though, you want to expand beyond just, uh, beyond just uh, you know, who is your maintainer. And then you want to look at Orbit, uh, Bitergia, CEO is somewhere around here running, so you can meet him at, at this conference as well. Chaos can also help you a bit from Linux Foundation to look into that. But in general, what you want is to aggregate data from multiple sources. So for, the, for those tools, which Orbit and so on can do, you can connect your GitHub, Discord, Discourse, Slack, Stack Overflow. You want to gather all of that information. And hopefully, the tool will then give you, OK, who are the people who are asking the questions or who are answering and who are contributing elsewhere as well. So. That is, if you once you start expanding beyond that, it's also good to monitor uh, that in general, so that you know how your community is developing. Uh, to do group uh, is also kind of gives you guides on how to build communities. So, finishing up, uh, what's the future? What should we strive for? Again, open source is a distribution model, not a business model. Planning is indispensable. Secure critical developers, automate what you can, and reach out to the community. You know, be active member there. For Meteor, uh, since to kind of wrap it up, Meteor Software is focusing on its interest as a company, as this MDG before. So it uh, could be a potential sticking point into the future. That's a risk of all commercially backed uh, projects, but. It's advancing steadily and very well, so there is right now no conflict. Uh, but still, as a community, we want to limit uncertainty. So I want to announce here that, uh, as a community, we'll be starting a drive to establish a Meteor Foundation to make sure that uh, we have a future. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. We are out of time, sadly. But if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy uh, you know, to answer them as we kind of change to the next speaker. So uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.